Hello, my name is Vaikuntan Rajaratnam. I'm a hand surgeon practicing in Singapore. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the management of spasticity. I'll confine myself mainly to adults and specifically in post-stroke spasticity. Our brain is the seat of perception of our universe and the seat of volution and how we execute function. And in this information processing system, which I have modified, uh, from the models uh, both in computing and in the brain, you can see how the mind, which is a function of the brain, perceives our universe through our senses. And the peripheral nerve is one of those uh, tissues that provides the senses. And it's also the tissue that executes the response through a motor action. The other functions which we won't go through, but for us to understand uh, how we impact the peripheral nerve, this is a good model. For us to look at. We are familiar with the various pathways. It is important for us to revisit how the peripheral nerve is connected to the central cord, to the central nervous system, to the spinal cord. The lamination of fibers are represented not just only in the brain of the homunculus. Similar homunculus are seen in the spinal cord. This is important for us to understand because Interventions can occur at various places, and this organization and complex uh, synapses are important for us to utilize in understanding and in managing nerve injuries. To understand the human grasp, which is an important aspect in upper limb surgery, we need to understand that there are neurons that would fire from the command center in the brain, and this has been shown through some studies. A single neuron for a complex task like a grasping action, a single neuron has been trained through a process of neural coding to fire multiple circuits to produce the complex motor function to produce the activity of grasp surgery. It is also very important to see how new neural pathways are created following an injury. And there are very interesting studies that have been done to show the mapping that occurs, there's not only a mapping that occurs in the brain that we are familiar with the homunculus, similar mappings are available in the spinal cord. So there are command centers in the spinal cord that would single neuron would fire as a result of predetermined uh, uh, complex commands from the brain to ensure that rapid motor firing will occur in the peripheral organ in the limb. To be able to manage post-stroke spasticity, it is important to understand the pathophysiology of spasticity. It is the reduction in the inhibition of the upper motor neuron on the lower motor neuron, which results in a velocity-dependent increase in the tone of the peripheral muscles with hyper-excitability, and also important to realize the co-contraction of antagonists and agonists, and the neglect of which will result to the, pre, uh, to the presentation of muscle contractures and will result in deformity. The common causes of spasticity are cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries, and stroke. 30% of stroke will end up with spasticity and about 80% of spinal cord injuries ends up with spasticity. In Singapore, there are about 6,000 cases of strokes per year and there is a prevalence rate of about 33 to 50% of spasticity among the patients with stroke, and they have a significant reduction at functional ability at the end of one year. Spasticity presents itself with, apart from the loss of function, is the pain that is produced by the spasticity within the muscles, the easy fatigability, and the presence of involuntary movement. They then, if neglected, end up in severe contractures of the musculotendinous unit with skin maceration. And also it's very important to understand there is a problem of self-image with spasticity and the stigma of the deformity. We are familiar with the classical presentation of the deformities in spasticity, especially with hemiplegia and the flexion pronation deformity with the ulnar deviation, the clenched fist. I won't forget the shoulder and the elbow, the classical flexion deformity in the elbow and abduction and internal rotation deformity in the shoulder. It is very clear in the literature that 
for the treatment of spasticity in strokes, you require a multidisciplinary team. And this is our team in Singapore. Uh, three years ago, we designed and developed a new pathway for the management of post-stroke spasticity with our neurologist and our rehab physician. These are the members of our multidisciplinary team uh, that provides an integrated approach to the management of post-stroke spasticity. We did a literature review to find the evidence for the various treatment for spasticity, and this is our spasticity care pathway and our algorithms for the patients to be referred to the team and how we use surgery, which is about one in five patients referred to us uh, undergo surgery. Our referral criteria for spasticity need not be confined to stroke. We also accept those with spinal cord injury and also neurodegenerative disorders. And we've seen a few cases of post psychotic medication, uh, dystonia that we use for the treatment of our spastic uh, presentations. With our inclusion criteria for our patients, we only uh, consider surgical intervention in those who are functionally good and who are able to. Uh, perform in society. Bed-bound patients are not included into our patient selection for surgery unless for hygiene and nursing purposes. These are the two instruments that we use to measure the uh, hand function from spasticity using the house classification. And for the uh, extent of spasticity, we use the modified Ashworth scale. These are validated instruments, however, they do not totally measure the impact of the spasticity on the psychosocial and the biological aspects of the patient comprehensively. These are our treatment modality. We only treat patients who have got a good expectation of improvement and we also use to relieve contractures. These are our non-surgical methods which are splinting, the use of oral medication, physical therapy. We use Botox mainly for the purposes of assessment as a therapeutic trial to see whether the patients feel better with the relaxation of the muscle prior to doing neurectomies. Surgical treatment apart from uh, uh, deformity correction with tendon and muscle procedure, uh, we also do arthrodesis for stabilization and most importantly in early cases and in selected cases we perform selective neurectomy. Occasionally we have conducted amputations. The types of surgery that are available for upper limb uh, reconstruction for spasticity a lot as I mentioned earlier from selective neurectomy to correction, correction of deformity and tendon transfer. Generally any form of surgery in the uh, upper limb for spasticity has been shown in this systematic review to be useful. Remember that the level of evidence are all not level one because of the nature of the heterogeneity of the populations that have been reviewed. Generally, they provide anecdotal uh, results that are good, improve in function, reduce spasticity, pain, and height. The functional outcome following spasticity reducing surgery uh, is generally tends to be pretty good. And here in this uh, prospective study at one year, mainly using uh, uh, tendon lengthening uh, procedure, they found that there was a maintenance of reduction in spasticity and pain and improved hand function. To understand the uh, types of surgery for uh, neurectomy, this uh, summary by Dominic Powers and uh, Petros uh, Mikhailov shows the terminologies that are used. Uh, whether you're using hyperselective motor neurotomy or uh, hyperselective uh, uh, motor neurectomy. Uh, we tend to do uh, selective motor neurectomy. In the hyperselective neurectomy, as uh, proposed by Caroline Lecaire, the important is to remove all the motor fibers to the target muscles. And this is a very extensive procedure with a very large incision. And the advantage is that it is, tends to be durable without uh, early recurrence. Um, and it ensures wide uh, denervation. Uh, in a systematic review by Willam and work co-workers uh, on the role of selective peripheral neurectomy, uh, the percentage of fascicles that needs to be uh, divided out ranges from 30 to 80 percent, but generally we use about 75 to 80 percent. We take at least a centimeter of nerve is uh, excised to ensure no regeneration occurs, 
and the reported re recurrence rate is about 0 to 16 percent and I would probably say it's 10 to 15 percent. We have had not to go back into any of our cases yet. And the surgical intervention for spasticity in the upper limb has been shown to improve the lower limb. I first mentioned this three years ago in Chiang Mai and uh, a lot of people were wondering whether, whether I was uh, uh, a real. Uh, this is a paper that's recently come out that shows that by uh, reducing the spasticity upper limb, upper limb it helps in the lower limb and there's, there is a the cognitive neuroscience basis of this because of the hyper uh, excitability of the motor neurons in the adjacent uh, part of the cord which can be the lower limb. And the other important thing is there are significant benefits from upper limb spasticity correction surgery, especially in very severely disabled spasticity from improving body function, uh, gains in activity in social life. So it not only improves the biophysical aspect, but also the psychosocial aspects. This is a qualitative study that was done uh, from Sweden. And I think it's very important that if you want to measure the outcomes in spasticity, that you should do qualitative studies. Because if you try and measure the improvements in the functional gain, you may find it very little, but the cognitive load is significantly reduced because of the reduction in the spasticity. And this requires further work. Yeah. Here we look at some we do neurectomy. This is some of our cases. We've okay. done uh, FDS neurectomy, shows the role of the stimulator, identifying the fascicle that is, is uh, involved, the and FDS. specifically to uh, yeah. use to divide That's only it. the okay. branches that are to that muscle and leaving at least 25% to 20% of the classical so as to have some voluntary control okay. of the muscle. Here you can see one centimeter of the nerve being excised uh, in the uh, nerve that is incriminated in the spasticity. Here we see a flexor pollicis longus that has been uh, stimulated. Usually there's only one branch and so you must be, uh, you can either just take out 80% of it, but I remove the whole uh, segment to ensure that uh, you have uh, denervation. Here you see the patient post-op with the relaxation. This is, you can see the post-op, the plaster still infects. Both the FDS and the FPL has shown relaxation. And this has to be maintained with uh, intensive rehab. to ensure the uh, correction. Here we see the lower limb and you can see very clearly the FHL in the diagram and the gait uh, which was not comfortable in this patient with the uh, FHL and F, uh, 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 FDL. So here we have a neurectomy being performed, uh, the identification of the nerve uh, for the uh, neurectomy in the lower limb. And here is the FHL that has been identified and the flexor digitorum longus and they are then uh, identified. And here's the patient postoperatively. You can see that the gait has improved and he has less of a curling of the toes and he, uh, I, when he asks him qualitatively, he finds it's better and easier to move and improve in gait time. And here you can see the correction that you can see post Contralateral C7 transfers for the reanimation of the upper limb has been well established since 1986 for brachial plexus injuries. Recently, it has also been used for spasticity and has documented that the donor defects are compatible with function and has significant improvement in functions in the upper limb. Recent studies have clearly shown the anatomical basis for the outcome seen in contralateral C7, and this review is worth a uh, read to understand how the contralateral C7 produces uh, functional outcomes in the motor of the target muscles. In this landmark paper by Shang et al. from Shanghai uh, on a randomized control trial showed the superiority and functional outcomes on contralateral C7 transfer as the intervention in post-stroke spasticity with outcome measures both in the Fergal Mayer score and the modified Ashford scales uh, with improvement. Donor mobility was minimal uh, and was recorded and was compatible with function. This set the stone for the 
extensive uh, use of contralateral C7 over the last 10 years in the reanimation of the upper limb in post-stroke spasticity. In this recent paper by Li et al. had shown the uh, structural changes that occurred following contralateral C7 transfer uh, using tectographic uh, MRI uh, techniques uh, showing that the improvement in function was secondary due to structural changes in the pathways as a result of this nerve transfer. Recently, there has been studies that have shown the role for nerve transfers not just in the upper limb from the contralateral C7, but in hemiplegia following stroke, the improvement in lower limb function with the transfer of the L5 nerve root contralateral to the S1 has shown to improve the function in the lower limb. In this study by Yang et al., it shows the uh, functional outcome and also the technical uh, details on to, to perform this procedure. It can be seen in this talk that the management strategies for spasticity in the upper limb and lower limb is evolving and the role of neurectomy, highly selective neurectomy and nerve transfers are improving and there are more work that needs to be done. However, in the measurement of outcomes has been quite unsatisfactory with this current instrumentation. That requires to have more fine instruments to measure the targeted uh, interventions that have been done and not just for pure global outcomes. It's also too important to understand the experiences of the patients as the cognitive load and spasticity affects function significantly. Uh, there requires to be more interaction in the multidisciplinary team involved in the care for post-stroke spasticity that requires counseling, education, and targeted research is needed for us to be able to gather evidence for the importance of surgery in uh, post-stroke spasticity.